Welcome to episode 183 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to, once again, retired agent Keith Tolhurst, who served in the FBI for 24 years. During his career, he investigated kidnappings, domestic terrorism, violent crimes, bank robberies, and fugitive matters. In this episode, he reviews an extortion case where the subjects threatened to kidnap and cut off the arm or leg of the 12-year-old son of an Arizona millionaire businessman, unless he paid them $250,000. Through a series of phone calls and notes, the scheme provided directions to the victim on where to drop the money. Frank Alber was arrested, convicted of conspiracy and mailing threatening communications, and sentenced to six years in prison for the elaborate plot. Currently, Keith Tolhurst is the founder of Tolhurst International, LLC, a licensed private investigations firm that also provides security consultants, training courses, and guest speaker services. Keith was previously interviewed on episode 125 about the case of a prison escapee who led the FBI and law enforcement partners on the largest fugitive manhunt in Arizona. Before we get to the interview, I need to let you know that the audiobook for FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, is now out. And currently, Nook and Apple Books slash iTunes are offering substantial discounts, but I'm not sure how long the reduced prices will be around. The audiobook, ebook, paperback, and hardback for FBI Myths and Misconceptions are available wherever books are sold, but you can find an easy link to some of the retailers in your podcast app's description of this episode. If you've already picked up a copy of FBI Myths and Misconceptions, Thank you. Please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. The other thing I want you to know is that I missed you. I was away for most of the month of September on what I'm calling my European world tour, also known as vacation. I just wrote a post for my October reader team email about the trip and my observations about the presence of law enforcement in the cities I visited, Paris, Amsterdam, and Prague. I included a few interesting photos. If my October Reader Team email is not in your inbox, please check your spam filter. There's also a link to join my Reader Team in the description of this episode in your podcast app. Once a month, I send out my email digest and try to keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. I want to thank you for your support. You are the best. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Keith Tolhurst. Hi, Keith. How are you? Doing great. How are you today, Jerry? I'm doing great. And I can tell you that the last case review that you did has been well received. People were fascinated. And I hate to tell you this, but I think they were more fascinated with the The dogs. That's that's (laughs) always the case. It was really, really interesting. It's gotten lots of downloads. So uh, you have a lot to live up to in this one. No pressure, though. (laughs) (laughs) Well, great. I hope they enjoy this one as much. Okay. And so this one, you know, you've told me a little bit about it, but basically it is an extortion case and your subjects were extorting money from a millionaire? That's correct. That's correct. So it started back in 1992 and this was about as classic of an extortion case as you would see on television, the kind of things that don't normally happen in all extortions, but it started with a letter that was mailed to uh, the victim who was a millionaire and had a 
had a business, uh, internet business in, in vitamins and things like that. The victim uh, received this letter demanding that he pay $250,000 or the millionaire's son, who was, I believe, at 12 years old at the time, would be kidnapped. And they said if they kidnapped him, they would keep him alive, but they would amputate an arm or a leg uh, because they had military experience and they knew how they could amputate uh, one of his limbs and the child would still be able to survive that because what the uh, extort uh, the people doing the extortion wanted to do was make the millionaire regret for the rest of his life not paying the money because he could see his son live without that limb. So that was kind of the the uh, pressure they were trying to put on him if he decided not to play not to pay. I've the never way. heard of anything like that. That's really diabolical and cruel. It was, and they they were even they they kind of made it like a game. They said uh, we will give you the option if you choose to run and try to hide your child, that's fine with us. Uh, and you can just go ahead and do that. And if you can survive a, a year on the run, then we'll move on to someone else and leave you alone. Uh, I think they indicated something like that didn't help, that didn't work too well for the last person that tried that. They did it in Europe or something like that. Um, but they said, however you call the police, there's no longer a year time limit. We will hunt you down no matter what. So they said, uh, we will we will contact you by phone, and if you don't answer, then then the hunt will start. And that's basically uh, how they how they left it. So that was on I think it was on February seventh that he received the letter. Obviously, told not to tell, call the police and to pay the money, and he'd hear from them. Uh, and he also said that they would he would receive a phone call on the thirteenth at two o'clock at his office. So that was a Thursday. He had to go into his office and waited for the phone call. Obviously, he called us before that happened. Uh, we set up trap and trace on his phones, and then we just had to wait. We didn't really have a lot of a lot to go on. We started doing backgrounds on him and some of the people he knew and things like that, but there really wasn't anything going on until we saw if there was actually a letter that happened or whether this was just a, a joke kind of a, a letter that he'd received. So you did have something concrete for him to show you. It wasn't I'm yes, it was, it was a computer-generated letter that he received through the mail. And that was the letter that said that they demanded the $250,000 and all the details about how his son would be kidnapped and have be amputated, and that this is his one and only chance to comply, that he had uh, the kidnappers had military experience, that his child would survive, so he'd have to live with his decision if he decided not to pay, not to call the police, but if he wants to try to hide the child, like this is a hunt, it's a game, they said. And if they survive a year, then they'll move on. But if they call the police, there's no time limit that they'll hunt them down and find them eventually. And basically said time is on their side. And they can, they can outweigh law enforcement to, to give up on it. Wow. The next thing that happened is Thursday at the call. Of course, we're set up waiting for the call. Typical FBI procedures as we try to get in and out of the buildings where no one can see us. So in case they're watching them, all that, all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to stay as, as hidden as possible. The call didn't come at two o'clock. We started to think maybe there's nothing to this. But then all of a sudden, about 2.15 or so, there was a caller. And the caller uh, told him uh, that, um, oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, let me back up. Prior to that, also in the letter, it said you'll receive a call at two with further instructions, but you should have the $250,000 ready in a bag with $100 bills in it, or made up of $100 bills. And then also you should have $1,000 in spending money on your person. He said, if you don't have to call, then, then the game is going to start. So that's kind of the end of the letter. So then the call did occur. It was about 15 minutes late. And the caller, all it said was go to the Security Pacific Bank uh, over on, we have main crossroad in the city of Phoenix is Tatum and Shea. And he said, you'll find a note taped in the drive through The Security Pacific Bank was closed down. It was a vacant building. So we had uh, the victim uh, drive to the bank. And uh, he had a telephone that he could talk to us on, but that was it. As this was in 92, there wasn't a whole lot uh, of other technology at the time that we could use. And he went out and uh, got to the bank and found the note. And it was taped to one of the pylons in the drive through area. And he uh, read the note and read it over the phone to us. The note basically said that he was to uh, drive out to Saguaro Lake Park. Now, that's, that's a, a, a lake that's about 30 miles away. So it was a fairly nice, nice day, a little overcast for Phoenix. 
but it was a nice day. And he drove out towards Suara Lake Park, which out at Suara Lake, it was actually rainy. Uh, it had uh, very overcast and cloudy, and there was a lot of rain out there. So basically, he was supposed to drive to Suara Lake Park. And uh, the letter said that uh, he would find a look for a black paint mark. This was on the note that was on the bank. Look for a black paint mark on the rock at Suara Lake Park. And it gave him specific instruction, instructions on what route to drive and how he had to get there and which which part of the park to go to to look for the black paint. And then he said, buy the back paint, he'll see a fishing line, and follow the fishing line down to another bag. And uh, get that bag and look inside, there'll be a, a note. So he did. He drove out to the lake. Obviously, we had surveillance on him. Uh, we tried to get people out ahead of time since he had called us and told us where he was, where he was headed to get out to the lake and things like that. The next thing that happened, he gets to Suara Lake Park. Like I said, it's kind of rainy out there. Because the weather's not nice, there's nobody at the lake. There's, I think there was two people kind of in fishing mode, but they weren't really fishing down by the water and one or two other people total in the entire park. Uh, and it's a, it's a large lake. I mean, it's a popular destination on weekends and things like that. So at the lake, uh, he goes over and um, finds the bag. And with the... Uh, well, he's there, our surveillance notices uh, two people in two different cars at the lake. One guy's in a red Corvette. The other guy was in a tan sedan. I don't remember what kind of car it is. Or, but the two people we later identified, one, his name is Mark. He was in the red Corvette. And the other guy's name is Mike. And they were kind of talking to each other out their driver's windows in both of their cars. But they were kind of in a position, and they were, they were standing around their cars as well, kind of got out and walking around. And they were in a position where they could see our victim uh, getting the bag out and bringing it over to a picnic table to open it up and look inside. He looks inside, the, the victim looks inside, sees that it has a note in there. The note says, take your shirt off, turn around, take the tape out of the bag, put, put the money in the smaller bag. There was a bag inside the bag. It says, put the money inside the smaller bag, tape up the handle. And even told him like how many wraps of tape he wanted around the handle. And then... Uh, leave your bag behind and take that bag and get in the car and go to Australia Park. And Australia Park is on the exact opposite side of the Phoenix metropolitan area. So it's probably from Saguaro Lake. I guess it's like a hundred miles, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe 70. It's, it's, it's the entire distance of all the communities of Phoenix and the metropolitan areas. It's the entire opposite side going from the East end of, Phoenix to the far southwest end of Phoenix. And it was the northeast end of the southwest end. And it gave him specific driving instructions as well, where to go, all that kind of stuff. And it said, the note also said, what you're going to do is go to a red fire hydrant. And the Australia Park area that he was being sent to at the time was a housing development that had no houses. So it just had the road and the curbs and some of the driveway pullouts. And that's all. There was no houses built yet. It hadn't gotten to that point. But it did have the, the infrastructure with the, the fire hydrant kind of things and, the, and, like I said, the curbs and all that. So what was the deal with him taking off his shirt? Well, I think the implication of is you take your shirt off and turn around to make sure you don't have a wire on, you're not being recorded, and the police aren't involved, and that he's being observed. I think that's what the letter was supposed to intend to mean. All right. So what he did then, uh, and, and interesting, uh, later, uh, uh, kind of an aside, and I'll give you some of these as we go along. But the individual, Mike, that was out there at the lake in the car talking to Mark, we interviewed him later. And Mike said the reason that he was at the lake that day was he just found himself that way after he was driving down the road following clouds. So that was his best reason for how he came out there. I think later on he changed it to he was going out there to drink beer. But originally his, his initial statement was he was going out to follow clouds. Okay. What a great <laughs> alibi. It is, isn't it? So, <laughs> so then he starts to go to towards Australia Park. On his way there, okay, so this was on the 13th still. So one of the things that we had, he was going out there, and obviously the area he's going to is from kind of a, the city area out to a mountainous area, the curvy roads that get out into the lake, and then back out through the city and all the way across. Well, when he was going through the curvy roads in the mountain the uh, cell phone service was very bad. So we had a hard time staying in touch with him. And the victim was obviously extremely nervous. Uh, this, I mean, 
this isn't a normal thing to pe for people to have to go through to deliver $250,000 and all this other stuff. So what he did is he, coming back, he started to get nervous and he pulled in to a McDonald's. And when he pulled into the McDonald's, he didn't get out of his car. He just sat in his car at the McDonald's and he's trying to get cell service where he can call us to tell us where he's going next and what's going on. But obviously he doesn't want to bring the phone up to his ear. He doesn't know who's watching and all that. Well, our surveillance was watching him anyway. And what we noted at the time was the red Corvette with Mark had also pulled into the McDonald's, the one that was out at the lake, and driven by the back of the victim's car to see what he was doing. Victim, then we got in touch with him. We said, go to whatever the instructions tell you. He kept following the instructions and headed the rest of the way out towards Australia Park. So he got to Australia Park. At Australia Park, what he got was he got to the, the mailbox. Or I'm sorry, got to the uh, fire hydrant, rather. And there was a fishing line tied to the fire hydrant. He followed the fishing line out into the, the desert, which is, you know, which will eventually become housing area. And the, it was tied on the other end to a plastic bucket full of dirt. And right next to that was a piece of plywood. And his directions had told him to move the plywood, and he did. And here was a, a wooden box, a well-constructed wooden box that had been fitted into a hole in the, in the ground. And it was the same size as the bag that the money was now in. And he was told to put the money in the box, put the plywood back on top, and then take the dirt from the bucket and throw it all around the, the top of the, uh, the plywood so there was no sign of the dirt being there. And then bring the bucket and the fishing line back, put in his car, and leave. And he would hear again from someone within two weeks if everything was good or if it was not good. And that's kind of how the extortion got started. That's pretty elaborate. It was. It was very elaborate. So obviously, we had great surveillance teams and a lot of people involved. But we now we're, we've got people that we're trying to surveil the area. We're trying to we're, we have uh, protection for the the victim. We're, all these different kind of things. A lot of moving parts going on with that. And we're at ground zero. We have no clues as to what's going on. The first clue that we really had though was that the phone call that came in that told him originally to go to the bank to get the next note, that phone call came in from a grocery store uh, over in Chandler, Arizona. We had an agent there. The, I think the phone call was at uh, like 220, 225. We had an agent there by 250, had already identified the location of the phone and was now marking the phone. He protected it so no one could touch it. He did make a collect call from the phone to the FBI office to mark the call that came out of there so we could go from that number and look previously to see what other calls had been made. We were ready to try to find out if we could get any information off that phone. That evening, we got fingerprints taken from that phone. And the fingerprint came back to Mike, the guy that was out at uh, Suara Lake. So now we think this Mike and Mark guy are, might be involved. We've seen them both at the lake. We've seen one of them at the McDonald's. And then we saw the other one at uh, uh, his fingerprint on the phone that made the phone call. So when these guys are our best bet, but we really don't know who they are other than we, we've identified their names. Uh, we had the license plate, obviously, off the Corvette. So we knew we could get the two people, but that's about as far as we've gone. We started looking further into, we don't want to approach them yet. Uh, we look into other witnesses and things like that. The guy, Mark, a witness said that they had heard him say that people in the vitamin business owe him big and that he is about to come into some big money which obviously our victim was in the vitamin business. So that was interesting. And then he also had worked at a construction company and Mark had talked about the victim by name that he had worked at the construct when he was working at the construction company that he knew who he was. So that's kind of where we're at with Mark. And then Mike, we're kind of thinking, okay, the other thing with him that was interesting is he does construction work. And he is a framer. I can't remember if framer or if he did finish work, but he, he was working with, uh, with wood. And here this was a well-made box that the money went in. So we're kind of thinking pretty good about these two guys. And then all of a sudden on the 17th, which is only a couple days later, my SAC, Jim Ahern, calls me up. He calls me up and says, uh, listen, he said, uh, I just want you to know that uh, the media has found out about this case. 
and I've got them to withhold reporting it for 24 hours. So you better start making some arrests or figuring out who did it. Now, the money walked in the bag. Yes. So, well, yes, and it did. We actually had uh, the equivalent of money in the same size number of bills and things like that and put that in the box. There wasn't actually money in the bag, okay. but they didn't know that at the time. So that was something that we had just set up rather than put the actual money out there. We knew that it would only be people surveilling it, if anything. But that was out there. It's buried in the ground and it's waiting and we have surveillance on it. And we also have, uh, I think we had some some kind of tracking equipment, things like that to try to see just in case we missed it in the surveillance. So I get told I've got 24 hours. We've got to figure out who did it before it goes public because now it won't be a secret that he involved the FBI. So on the, I think that was on the 17th, on the 19th, we filed a complaint against Mark and Mike and uh, uh, arrested them on the next day uh, on the 20th. Mark and Mike were both arrested and we brought him in and interviewed him. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that you knew the time was ticking because the media was aware of what's going on, would you have preferred just to wait and sit on the money? Yes. In fact, we did that anyway. Uh, we ended up sitting on the money. I uh, can't remember how long, I think almost a month. But we sat, we sat on the, the money for quite some time just to see because if anybody came to get it. We had snipers out there. And it, 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 a funny aside, I remember one of our snipers from our SWAT team is out in the bushes wearing a ghillie suit, one of those camouflage suits. And he's blended into the bushes very well. And as he's out there, uh, some people decided to go out and look at property in the Australia Park area, something they were potentially going to buy to build a home on. And they're standing out in the desert. And one, and the, this is a story told by uh, the sniper out there. The one uh, husband and wife, and the wife says to the husband, I think there's something moving, moving over in that bush over there. And they both decide to leave rather quickly because they couldn't tell what it was. And they didn't like the fact that they thought, well, it wasn't a bush. It was actually a person. But there was... They, they thought that something was there. They left and obviously didn't buy the property there uh, at the time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so we kept eyes on that, uh, that box the entire time the case was going on. And they never, no one ever came out to pick it up. Not that we knew at the, at the time. What we did have happen a couple of times. Now you have to understand there was probably a hundred agents involved in this case. So we're trying to manage a lot of moving parts at the same time. We had, Surveillance is now on Mike. We had surveillances on Mark. We had protection on the victim. We had surveillance on the box. We had interviews going on of all the other people that were out at the lake. So all these things are happening, and we're trying to record every license plate, everything that we found, and then do backgrounds on all these people going on. Australia Park, even though nobody was there, people went through there every once in a while to see if it was a property they wanted to purchase things like that. So we were getting a, a log of all these license plates that were going through Australia Park. And this was going on for a couple of weeks. So let me back up. We had these guys, uh, we arrested these guys on the 20th. We brought them in for an interview. They both agreed to interview. During the interview, Mark stated that he didn't know the victim, but the name was familiar and that he had painted his door. Apparently, Mark, he was a painter, but he was a specialized painter, and he didn't paint houses. He only painted front doors. So he painted the victim's front door at one time, and that, he claimed, was his extent to knowing who the uh, victim was. We had witnesses, other witnesses that we had now interviewed that stated that Mark was trying to buy, was trying to obtain uh, $1.5 million to purchase a bar. So we knew he was looking for money. We had people stating that he was about to come into money soon, that he knew somebody in the vitamin business. Uh, all this kind of stuff was all fitting together very well as far as that this might be our guy. I'm thinking about this 12-year-old boy. And although you know that you have two people in custody, what kind of safety measures are being taken at that time to make sure that there's not somebody still out there who is going to do harm to the victim's son? Well, uh, two things. The victim actually had hired some security himself, plus the FBI was staying with him. 
pretty much day and night uh, initially. And after we rescued people, we still stayed with them most of the time. Our, our view of it was until the money got picked up and we could do something with that, he was still in danger. We, we didn't want this information out, especially now that they had gotten to the point where they had said, now the newspaper broke the story on the 20th that these two guys had been involved in this extortion. And I, I don't want to keep interrupting you because I know you're on a, on a, on a flow. But oh, that's fine. Yeah, exactly what did the, the newspaper article say? How much information did they have and how did they learn about it? Or did you ever find out? I don't know how they learned about it. I don't, that's one thing. I don't know where that initially came from. That was a uh, confidential relationship between the, the head of the, the Arizona Republic newspaper and our SAC. And they had agreed to hold the story for uh, a day, but I don't think he got the source of it. But that information basically, like I said, it got out. The, the, re- the reports, I believe, and I'm, again, this is in 92, so I'm trying to remember the newspaper articles. There was a lot of them on this case. But I think the first one reported the two individuals uh, that we had arrested by name, date of birth, everything, and that they were involved in this extortion attempt. And it did identify the whole detail of the extortion that the, the little boy's life was threatened and that uh, um, they were going to cut off a limb and they wanted $250,000. I believe all of that was in the paper. Not necessarily what you want to hear or, or what it's. Yeah. Not what, the ideal way to pursue an investigation is when it's now a public investigation, because obviously we already had a lot of moving parts. And now when you start getting helpful individuals, it's a lot of leads to run down that may have nothing to do with anything. Right. But it just kind of adds to the manpower problem a little bit. But like I said, we had 100 agents working on it. You know, I have to say there's almost a theme to the cases that you work on. It sounds like between this case and the prison escapee case, you're always pulling out hundreds of agents to <laughs> work on your case. Yeah, I don't, in fact, it was, it's funny. It came out. One of the, one of the things, you know, like I said, this guy wrote a, a book against, against me, I guess, pretty much. He's saying how the government conspiracy was after him and everything. And one of his points was, this was a four-year FBI agent in charge of 100 people. He obviously shouldn't have been doing this or something. So <laughs> <laughs> You only had four years in at the time when you were right. hitting up this particular uh, case. Yes. And, and the funny thing is, I think this was, this was within a year of the other investigation. Right. So back-to-back, yeah. very important manpower intensive cases. Yeah. And the FBI doesn't work alone. We've got a great network. Yeah. A lot of people think that the management is kind of out of touch with the, the working agent. And I was a working agent my whole career. This SAC took out the phone list of all the agents in the Phoenix division. He says, you can have access to any of these people. And I thought I was going to get to pick who I wanted. And then he started putting check marks by all the names of the people that I would get to have work for me. And I'm looking at the check marks and they were the best agents in the office. So this SAC knew who the best people in the office were. May not be the ones that got the accolades from him and it may not be the ones that he'd go have a drink with, but these were definitely the people that were, he, he knew who the workers in the office were. It, it gave me some reassurance about how the management works uh, in the FBI that he did definitely did know who was, who was the good employees. Good to know. I, but anyways, I, I, so we had all these people working on the, uh, we finally decided to give Mark a polygraph. We actually gave him a polygraph twice. He failed both times. We tried to give uh, Mike uh, a polygraph. And he initially agreed to take it, but then after talking to, uh, I think his father came in, he decided that he did not want to take a polygraph, so he never took one. So somewhere around in this time, we were also doing a parallel investigation because most extortions are involving someone that has a relationship with the victim somehow and trying to figure out who that might be. We identified one disgruntled former employee that looked pretty good is a possibility. And his name was Frank Albert. So we're looking at him and trying to determine if there was anything to him or not. Now in the, in the fog of war kind of a thing, you mentioned, did we find anybody go out to Australia park on the 18th, which was only a couple of days after the, the, uh, this broke, it came out in the news on the 20th, but on the 18th, Frank Albert's vehicle was recorded, his license plate was recorded driving by the box on the road out in Australia Park. 
Unfortunately, we had so many surveillance logs going on at the time, we just missed connecting the dots that Frank Albert was the employee, Frank Albert, that we were kind of looking at. So that wasn't known at the time or hadn't been uh, connected at the time. The next thing that happened, now let's see, that was like uh, on the 18th that he drove by. We arrested uh, Mike and Mark on the 20th. On the 23rd, which is a Sunday, another individual came forward and his name was Rick. And he stated that he knew Frank Albert and that he knows that Frank Albert was probably involved. Now, we asked him how he knew that. And he said that he helped him make a phone call. So what it turned out was this guy, Rick, and Frank Albert made a phone call from the pay phone at the grocery store in Chandler when they called to, to say to move to Saguaro Lake Park. So the phone call that came in, that even though we had Mike's fingerprints on it, the phone call was actually made by Rick and Frank Albert. So now we're trying to figure out how this could have happened because we knew what day the phone was cleaned. I think the phone was cleaned on a, on a Tuesday. I, I think the call was also on a, I, I don't know if it was, I think it was like a Wednesday or something like that. So there wasn't any many fingerprints on the phone. So Mike had to make a call that day uh, or just before or just after the fall, the call came in. We started thinking, okay, maybe Mike was counter surveilling the call to make sure whoever was told to do it did what they were told to do. Or we couldn't really exactly figure out how that happened. But the interesting thing was what actually had happened, and this is you know kind of a post discovery. What had happened was Rick, it was Rick's voice on the phone. He was reading a note that was written by Frank Elber because Frank Elber didn't want his voice on the phone call telling the victim where to go. Rick did not know what that was for. He just was reading a note. He, didn't, he claims to have not known whether there was an extortion or what it was, but he came forward to us. So we had, he had some certain credibility with us because he came forward and admitted what happened. So we took Rick and we put a rec body recording on Rick and sent him back to Frank Elber to have a conversation and see if we could find out if Elber would tell us what's going on with this. And now we know Frank Elber's going to be our guy. So Frank uh, and Rick have a conversation. Before yeah. you move on, I'm curious as to why you didn't just think that Mike and Mark were your guy. You had already arrested them. You had already caught them on surveillance and being involved in these different locations. Why did you think there was still somebody else out there? Well, the, the only there's we didn't know. The, the bottom line is we didn't know. We were trying to cover all our bets. We wanted to make sure there wasn't more people. Like you said, this is very elaborate to go from one end of town to the other end of town. How many people were surveilling it? The guy, they wanted the guy to turn around at the one at the lake. And these two guys were together at the lake, but then they went to the other side to Australia Park. Mark never went to Australia Park. He ever he went to buy at the McDonald's, he went home. So we're thinking, okay, there's someone else that's got to be at the other side of town. And who's doing that? And Mike didn't go there either. So we, we thought that there had to be more people involved because they wouldn't have had eyes on the first half of the extortion and not the second half. So that's kind of, that was kind of our thought process that there had to be more people trying to see what's, what's going on with this. As I said, so what we had now is we have Rick going to make this con contact to him. And it's a great call. Uh, it's a great conversation. In there, Frank Albert tells him, yeah, I told you to make the call. Yes, it is the one that's on the news. But no, I didn't know they were going to do any of that kind of stuff. He goes, I was just asked to make a call. Another guy, the victim owed some guy some money and this guy wanted it back. And he said he'd give me 500 bucks. So he is lying to our buddy Rick here now that's working with us. And he's lying to him about all the details, except the fact that, yes, they both made a phone call. But what we do have on tape is him admitting to making the phone call with Rick. That's all we have. But throughout the call, Rick is, or the conversation, Rick is saying, oh my gosh, you've got me in trouble. I'm going to get arrested. He says, no, you're not. Nobody's going to know who you are. And if it ever comes out, just tell him the truth that I, you know, I asked you to make this call. That's it. And nothing else. So that's as far as it goes with Rick, but at least we have a connection there. We have enough to get a search warrant. And then we go and get a search warrant for Frank Albert's house. Now, Frank Albert had previously been 
a computer specialist that was an employee for the victim. And he was pretty good with computers. That was his job. So when we got to his house, we searched everything and we seized his computers. And on his computers, he had wiped everything clean. Luckily, our CART teams, the people that do the computer forensic uh, analysis on the computers, the only thing they could find on the computer was a naming convention for a letter that was written. And the naming convention of the letter was extort two. So now we have a naming convention that he had written an extortion letter on his computer. And it, the computer it was kind of an unusual computer and the font and the, the uh, typing and all that matched the extortion letter that had originally been sent in the mail. So based on that, we go out and get some, an arrest warrant and we arrest Frank Albert as well. We find out during our investigation that Albert had been fired by the victim about six to seven months before that. And he didn't admit to anything during his interview, but he was talkative. He didn't, didn't, uh, he didn't, uh, he waived his rights and, and talked to us. Finally, we told him, we know you were involved. We've talked to Rick. He goes, that's what I was waiting to hear. He said, yes, uh, Rick and I made the phone call, but we did it for a, a guy named Richard Woolridge in California. We said, okay. And he tried, we tried to get more information from him about that, and we really didn't. But what it turned out was Richard Woolridge is fictitious, doesn't exist. He just made it up. And this is going to be his alibi now, just like he was lying to Rick. And he, oh, in the, in the conversation that we recorded, he told Rick, I don't know Mike or Mark. I don't know either one of these guys. So, so he's claiming he doesn't know these guys, but he's also trying to calm Rick down. Basically, Elber was trying to calm down Rick the whole time. He was worried that he was being involved in everything. Elber clearly was lying to Rick about everything else other than the fact that, yes, they both made the phone call, and that was admitted on there. But then he told him he didn't know Mark or Mike, and we couldn't really give a lot of credence to that because he also said he had nothing to do with anything other than trying to get 500 bucks. That's why he, wrote the, that's why he uh, made the phone call. And that was his total involvement in the extortion. And that's what he was telling Rick. So we think he was just trying to compartmentalize who knew what and didn't really want to give too much information out to Rick about really what was going on and didn't even want Rick to know that he did it. So after we arrested Albert, we brought him in. We found out that he had been fired by the victim six to seven months prior to this extortion taking place. And he would admit to nothing. He was blaming it all on this uh, Richard Wool, uh, Woolridge which we found out was a totally fictitious individual. He didn't exist, but he wouldn't confess to anything. Then we said, look, we know during our interview of him, we know that you spoke with Rick and we know that Rick made the phone call with you. And he even said to us, yeah, that, that's what I've been waiting for. Because he had promised Rick in that recorded conversation, if anybody asks me about that phone call, I will tell them that I told you to do it. So at least he honored that to Rick. And he just says, yeah, I had, I made the phone call with Rick. Rick didn't know what was going on. I just was doing this for a friend. And he stayed with the story about this fictitious guy in California. So anyways, we went to his house. We searched his, his computer on his computer. He uh, had the extort to naming convention deep in his computer, even though everything else had been wiped clean. The media had reported that his ex-wife, Frank Elber's ex-wife, knew the individual, Mike, who we had seen it out at Suara Lake. And then Elber failed his polygraph. He, he was inconclusive uh, or, dece or uh, deceptive on knowing Mike and Mark. He said he didn't know either one of those, and that, that came up inconclusive on his polygraph. So on the 26th now of February, we indicted uh, Elber. At the time, he was still claiming that he had only made the phone call with Rick at the request of this guy, Woolridge, and wasn't involved. We got a, a grand jury indictment on, uh, on them all, and then we went back into our investigation mode. Like I said, we stayed on that box out there for probably a month, uh, rotating surveillance teams for 24 hours a day, till we finally, after we had him indicted, he said he, you know, he acted alone and all all this other stuff. Or actually, he hadn't committed, uh, admitted it yet. We finally took the stuff out, removed the box, and and brought it in. This went on for quite a while while we were still working the investigation. And finally, days before we went to trial, Frank Elber confessed, and he said he would stipulate that he did all the crimes. But he also stipulated that he didn't know Mark or Mike. And when he stipulated that, it 
kind of uh, changed our process, even though we had all this circumstantial evidence against Mark and Mike, there's not a lot of jury appeal for a conviction against someone who's confessed and also doesn't know the other two people. So we went back in to drop charges on Mark and Mike. When we did, the judge told them in court, says the government has dropped charges on you, but based on the preponderance of evidence that I've seen, I would have convicted you both. So anyways, they, uh, they were dismissed. There were no charges against them, no charges pending now. And Frank Elber ended up getting convicted in January of 93 for uh, two counts, one of uh, mailing threatening communications and the other of conspiracy, both counts for six years each. They tried later to appeal the conspiracy charge, but based on the preponderance of evidence that we had with, with Mark and Mike and the fact that he dealt with Rick and possibly others, that he even named himself, Woolridge, uh, the conspiracy charge was upheld as well. And he did two, uh, uh, two 72 month sentences. Did the conspiracy charge have anything to do with him saying that he didn't know who Mike or Mark were? Well, conspiracy wasn't based on the fact that he said that they didn't, but the conspiracy was based on if he had committed the crime with any others. And you obviously have to have two people involved to have a conspiracy. It would have qualified probably anyways, the fact that Rick made the phone call with him. Even though we still believe that maybe Mike was in the, in the shadows, making sure that that call occurred. And that's why he went uh, from there to Suara Lake. And that's, that was his involvement, maybe making the box to put the money in. Uh, Mark obviously knew the family, had been to the house, had done work there. Mike also had the, the, uh, you know, the ex-wife of Elver said that, they, that he knew Mike. And these guys claimed to not know each other. Mark originally said he didn't know him, although he painted the door for his house. But we have other witnesses that stated that he talked about him by name a week or so before the extortion. So these were, there's just a lot of coincidences that were occurring. Mark did not have any money per se, but he's planning on buying a bar for a hundred, for a one and a half million dollars. He was expecting to come into money, all these things that we mentioned earlier. I still have some doubts as to what the involvement was of those two. In his uh, confession statement, it said, instead of going and dropping the box into the, into the dirt in Australia Park, what he originally was going to do was have someone fly up in a helicopter and have this uh, stripper from one of the dance clubs get out and go over and get the money and go back and fly away with it. Then he decided that was too much like the movies and it would be too hard to orchestrate, and he decided not to do that. But the interesting thing, Park, about that was uh, Mark also was dating a stripper at the time. And that was kind of hit. He was into the strippers uh, and into the, the band style where he kind of promoted bands and tried to do things like that. So it kind of fit the lifestyle of how he would have found these people if it was for somebody like that. That's not part of our investigation, but those were just connections that we kept finding that make us think these other two guys were involved. Well, I know you said that Albert had been fired by the victim right. six months before, but the things that he was saying in the notes about what he was going to do to this victim's 12 year old son right. are so violent that it just seems that there has to be more <laughs> between, uh, between the two and their connections that he would he, be. He felt like he had been done wrong, that he, that he had done some computer work or software, software or something and thought that the guy, that the victim had owed him more money. I mean, there was definitely a, a bad taste in his mouth for the firing and the reasons for it and what he thought he was owed. I think the the uh, detail that he went into about having military type people that were going to cut the arm off or whatever and make sure that he lived because they could stop the bleeding and all that kind of goes into what he had mentioned before about how he was going to land in a helicopter and pick up the money. He had this movie-esque kind of a uh, thought process in his mind. And I think that's how he was trying to design this. Like I said, I, it's the only time I've seen where the extortion really goes all over town and they run people everywhere and do a lot of that. It, it, it's the only case like that I've had anyway that's actually tried to do it all. Yeah, this is definitely very, very different. I've uh, covered a number of actual kidnapping cases and thank God that this wasn't you know, an actual kidnapping of this 12-year-old kid. But I would imagine that when it comes to the damage that it did to this family, it may have been all mental, but it certainly... And, and it definitely was. In fact, in some of the appeals that he made after he was in prison, 
trying to reduce his his uh, time, he had made appeal that there was no mental stress against the victim. But what the court found was the victim didn't necessarily have mental stress, but the wife and the son uh, undoubtedly did. And based on that, uh, obviously, he didn't get any reduction in sentence. Yeah, you know, as a mother, you know, even even as a, a retired FBI agent, as a mother, sure. I'm distressed by the fact that that this note was sent and that this family had to go through this trauma of trying to make sure their son was safe during the time that you know the FBI was investigating. Yeah, yeah, it, and it was it was an ordeal, like I said, where we were keeping people there with them. It was a little bit of a of a conversation. He struggled from when he received the letter in the mail. It took him a few days before he made the decision to contact law enforcement. He was very concerned about what the letter said and how it said it. And what he did is the first thing he did was go to a police officer that was a friend of his and seek some advice on what do I do here? Do I just do what they say or do I make this a police matter? And that police officer actually convinced him to contact the FBI. And uh, that's how, uh, how I got involved was after it got to us that way. But that was a few days afterwards. So the letter was on the 7th. The note was on the 13th. I think we probably didn't hear about it till about the 9th or 10th that we finally got involved in the case. He didn't do anything right away. Wow. This is a, a, a very strange case. Was it ever made into a, a TV movie? I can imagine that it would be no, a great it, plot. Probably not because some of it, like I said, there was some follow on lawsuits where we were told that it was vindictive prosecution against Mark and Mike because they hadn't done anything. And of course that all comes out after you drop charges and uh, that all got dropped. The court went through and said, no, there's nothing vindictive here. Everything we did was based on the evidence at the time. Of course, you know, 2020, you look back on things and, and maybe you can have a different perspective, but as things are going, there are clearly information there. And then, like you said, the judge and other people that looked at this felt that there was enough clear evidence we just didn't see the taking these two forward because we couldn't we couldn't justify the disconnect between him saying he didn't know him. and that's why we really backed off on those two guys but we were sued later and the lawsuits like i said they were adjudicated in, in our favor but there was uh, nothing to this but in fact it was funny because these they sued us for vindictive prosecution and after the lawsuit finally was eradicated the us attorney called me again and said hey let's go back and refile on these two guys and <laughs> You know, as an FBI agent, I'm saying, look, we, we have no new evidence. We dropped charges based on where we were, and I don't see how we can redo that. That would be vindictive prosecution. <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, the U.S. attorney said, okay, fine. He says, why don't you come on down and talk about it? I said, well, how about if I send another guy down to talk about it? I'm, I had actually by then moved to a different, uh, different violation that I was working. So we just kind of let that one go. So Albert pleads guilty. What kind, yeah. of, uh, sentence, yeah, what kind of sentence did he get? He got two sentences of 72 months each. One was for conspiracy, and the other one was for mailing threatening communications. So each one was a six-year charge, and, uh, and he, I believe he did all, all his time. He's out now either way, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think he did all his time, less whatever you get for a good time and stuff like that. Good. Very good. Wow. Yeah, it really would make a, a, a great plot, you know, where at, at the same time, the, uh, of course, my mind is going to storytelling, but at the same time, you know, the FBI is trying to investigate, you know, you also have, you know, somebody trying to keep the boy safe and you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a diabolical scheme and thank God that it didn't work. Yeah, exactly. And we always say there's a certain amount of bravado on criminals that say things that don't happen, but you can't, we obviously can't do our jobs thinking it's not going to happen. You have to think like everything they say is going to happen and take it from there. But yeah, I don't think uh, Albert had the ability to do any of the things he said in his letter. He was just trying to uh, mentally uh, intimidate them to the point where it, he just got the money easily. Wow, oh, that's fascinating. Now, I think that during the last time that we spoke, episode 125, when you talked about the Grand Canyon prison escape case and the tracking dogs, I think right. I asked you then what, you know, why you joined the FBI and when you joined the FBI. Did we cover that? I think you did. Because, did I tell you that when I was 14, I was training dogs for the FBI? And got yes, 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 you did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Okay. So right. So, so we've already covered that. 
but I think the last time I spoke with you, you were working for the FBI as a contractor back at the academy, uh, dealing with human, uh, human sources. But um, are you still doing that now or are you doing something new? I just stopped doing that just recently, but uh, I wanted to try to get my business going a little bit more. I have a private investigation business and a consulting firm, and we go out and do uh, consulting to anybody from a school to a church to businesses to individual CEOs, houses on security. And we also do investigations for the state of Arizona. So, And I have pretty much a, a network nationwide that we can, we can uh, draw from, and we, we work some pretty big cases. Based our investigation, we're licensed for the state of Arizona, but we have licensed investigators that we have relationships with all over the world. So we can handle investigations everywhere. We've had clients from Guam, California, Virginia, Florida, Nebraska. We, we cover the whole gambit. Uh, anything we can do, uh, it's all on the website. And what's the name of your, what's the name of your firm, your security firm? The company's name is Tolhurst International, and we have a website, www.tolhurstinternational.com. Uh, that you can look at and see who we are and, and the kind of things we do. Two of the people that are in my consulting company, one is Ken Williams, who's a very famous person in the FBI as far as some of the things he's done. I, you need to get him on your podcast. Okay. And, and I have a lot of documents from this case. I didn't take any from the Bureau, but the Freedom of Information Act provided them all to Mark, who wrote a book about this uh, after it all occurred. So I have his book that has all the information on it. And the very first document that I looked at it had Ken Williams did the first first report of being at the phone phone booth and securing the phone. So I, I had to call Ken uh, yesterday when we were talking about doing the podcast. And I said, hey, just to let you know, uh, I told you I was doing a podcast, but you're going to be in it. You're the first guy that was on scene. So I thought that was interesting. Lately, the way I have been getting such great cases is, you know, different agents that I interview recommend and refer others. And so I hope that when I reach out for Ken, which I'll probably do as soon as you hang up, I hope he'll say yes. I don't know what he can talk about on his because he worked terrorism. Cool. I will put a link to your website. Tolhurst International. With the show notes for this episode. So if anybody is looking for a security firm to hire, they know we got a good guy here. That'd be great. So we're at the very end and I like to make sure that my guests have the opportunity to say everything that they want to say during the interview, even if I forgot to ask something or we forgot to discuss something important. So what I do is make sure that you have the last word. So what would you like to say? People don't realize that just one little extortion letter and things are going on, that uh, how many agents it takes. And I'd like to thank the hundreds of people, uh, surveillance agents and interviewers that were helping on in this, that when we were trying to beat, uh, beat the media to the punch and make these arrests, that uh, everybody really came together. And we got a lot done in, uh, in about a week. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Keith, a more detailed bio of his FBI career, and links to newspaper articles about the extortion case. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. This podcast is about true crime. But if you're also interested in crime fiction, I want to invite you to join my reader team, where once a month, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI, books written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You can join on my website or use the link in the description of this episode in your podcast app. I would love it if you also check out my books. My nonfiction, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. And there's also my Philadelphia FBI Corruption Squad crime series. All of my books are available wherever books are sold. 
Thank you for listening to the very end. And I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.